Hello, my name is Rusty Coons, and I have with me Brady Walker, founder of Classic Enterprises LLC, Ramming Speed Productions, producer, does tons of motorcycle related events. The guy's amazing. He's all over the place. How you doing, man? I'm doing great, Rusty. How are you doing? Thank you so much for having me on. Great, man. I'm glad to have you here, man. I want to talk about all these things you got going on. It's like, it's a lot, but that's cool. I dig that. But first, yeah. I want to go back into your history with motorcycles, where you grew up in Michigan. Can you, can you give me a little idea yeah. of what was going on back then and how you got involved with two wheels? Well, believe it or not, we got started with two wheels, not by two wheels actually happening. We were just living in the countryside playing i mean you know we're in our teens playing jacks or something you know going into the woods or playing basketball and a piece of property across the street came up for sale and a couple of days later this kid comes running down with his sister on the back they were both our ages my brother and i on a big red 350 three-wheeler honda just rolling down and we just dropped our basketball and we're like oh my god oh my god oh my god oh my god ran inside we need a three-wheeler right now so our parents bought us a couple of crappy 110s, a little Kawasaki and a Honda. And we raised hell until we were done with, until we got a driver's license, essentially. All through our early teens going out and we had all the room to explore. And uh, and so we rode three-wheelers. And so I didn't even ride motorcycles. I mean, we had bicycles and stuff, but we didn't really have motorcycles. We just had these three-wheelers. We just beat the living Christ out of them. And it wasn't until... I left and went to college. Oh, no, it was actually, it was closer than that. It was when I was in high school. And my dad, growing up, he had purchased an old crappy Triumph in the early 80s. I found the receipt for it in a box of photos. It was a 68 Triumph, 650, single carb trophy. And uh, it had been a basket case in the garage. I remember, you know, getting on it as a kid. Uh, there's no engine, but it was a roller with an engine and a box full of stuff. And uh, getting on it and being like, vroom, vroom, vroom. So when we uh, graduated from high school, all of our friends were having big parties and everything and big gifts. And my dad's like, well, you know, we don't have a lot of money, but, you know, is there something you want? You know, and I said, get that motorcycle running. So he did. And when I lived in um, Detroit the following year, um, I was at my grandma's and I would spin around and it was not like th th those kind of bikes were crap. It was kind of like what Honda CB three fifties were in the nineties. And then now what's the, what's the crappiest bike that no one wants at all uh, that will eventually become very, very popular. But when I was ripping around on this triumph, it wasn't cool. It was just an old crappy triumph, you know? Yeah. And uh, so really that's where my motorcycling career happened. Even though as a kid, we, lived outside my parents it was the time it's we can't i don't know los angeles is different it's a big 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 city but where we lived you know the doors were unlocked my parents worked all the all the time we came home from school on the bus and let ourselves in and and we just ripped around with full abandon did, my parents weren't scared of us getting hurt and of course we got hurt and then we got it taken care of and we go out and, you know have some fun so we we're very fortunate that we had that freedom as children back in those days. And the I was born in 76. So you're we're speaking like the early 80s, mid to late 80s. Great time growing up. And uh, so I lo love that little triumph. And I uh, brought it out to Los Angeles with me after I graduated from college in Ann Arbor and uh, finally made the move. And within a couple of months, I bought a Chevy pickup to drive out with because I packed it full of stuff and I drove it out with my stuff rather than renting something, you know, like a U-Haul. And within the first couple of months, the truck got stolen off the street, the streets of Venice. So here I am like, hey, wait, oh. wait a minute. You didn't leave the keys in it, did you? No. Yeah, you weren't back no. there in Michigan. <laughs> oh, no. It was so sad because it was a nice Chevy, but I had a guitar in there and some cool stuff. And I was like, yeah. oh, I'm so sad. Well, all I had left was the Triumph and the Triumph wasn't running great. It was, I essentially just threw it in the back alley where I lived and put a tarp over it. Like oh. immediately I had, I had a problem. So I had to fix it. So I got on the phone calling all these shops around Los Angeles and they're like, no, we don't work on that. And finally I got to, I don't know which person it was, but they said, call this guy. 
and that was Gary Swan. He's a uh, old crusty dude living up in uh, he was living up in um, up in the valley. And uh, he's like, hey, I said, I got this bike. He's like, I want I can come get it, you know, and I said, yeah, you have to. I can't bring it to you. There's no way, you know, and so it's going to cost this much. I said, fine, just get it running. Two days later, he had it back to me. And that's where our friendship started. We did a lot of racing together and everything like that. But once I had that triumph, that was my my wheels for a year and a half. I did not get another car. Uh, the next car that I got was given to me by a neighbor anyway. But ripping around on that triumph around town and especially just sort of living in the Venice scene, I hooked up with a group of guys, which was very loosely based, um, very early days of the Venice Vintage Motorcycle Club. So we would rip around on Wednesday nights and uh, just raise hell and have a good old time. And after doing a couple of years of this, uh, my friend Shannon Sweeney says, we need to have a party. We need to do something. There's bikes around. We know there's people. And we threw the first Venice Vintage Motorcycle Rally right on Abbott Kinney. Before Abbott Kinney was cool at the Stronghold. I think the Stronghold's still there. They sell jeans. And it was just, it was amazing. It was huge. We couldn't believe it. And so that's really, you know, I had some previous event um, event experience working with friends in Venice on another big festival called the Carnival. And I'd been cutting my teeth for 10 years doing this, working with the city, working with the fire department, working with the police department, working with the alcoholic beverage control. And when they said, well, let's do this big party with all these motorcycles. I said, I can do that. <laughs> I've been doing this for a long time. So it became very successful. And really that's where I started to really get into more motorcycling, hanging out with them. I, um, we would go to Willow Springs for the big Arma races, the road races. And we were there and I said, I'll be back here next year with a bike. And they're like, no, you won't. I said, I'm going to come and I'm going to race on this track. I watch me next year. We got my racing license, went out and raced. And I was like, yeah. so the whole club was there and they're all having a good old time. And you know, it was what it was. And so that pretty much was the catalyst. You, let me ask you something. So you were doing the racing on that. Now your wife also rides and she also yes. races, correct? Correct. So believe it or not, Caroline, uh, Caroline Patterson, Miss Blondzilla girl, as uh, people like to talk, talk to uh, her nickname or on social media. But um, we met in 2012 and we had actually met each other not briefly not formally but she had won something at one of the rallies that i actually gave to her and you know she's like i remember that and i said okay but we were at the hand for dam the norton ride the annual norton ride uh in the fall my bike broke down so we didn't get back to the back to the you know hansen dam until late and all of a sudden my friend anna who i know very well comes rolling up with this girl caroline and they're like, did we miss everything? I said, yes, you missed it by like 10 hours. I'm like, we're just broken down. They're like, oh, I said, but I've got a case of beer on ice and let's <laughs> hang out because everyone's hot. So about a, a, eight of us sat there and started talking. Well, Caroline had just previously broken up with her boyfriend who had a Harley and she rode on the back with. And when they broke up, she said, I'm either getting a horse or I'm getting in a motorcycle. Well, thank God she chose the latter. Because obviously a horse is, you know, especially in Los Angeles, a horse would cost you a fortune. But she hooked up with this guy named Jeremy. He got her a Honda CB350 and she started ripping around on it. And that's how we met each other. We came back to my place, the, the whole group of us from the Hanson Dam, rode back down to Venice. I threw a big party. We had a great time. And at the end of the night, I was like, this girl's kind of cool. So I invited her to uh, something and the rest is history. We, we got along real quick, real, real easy. So yeah, it wasn't, uh, you know, I dragged Caroline around for a year or two on the racing circuit and uh, she's like, there's girls racing here. And I'm like, yeah, I want to race. I'm like, cool. So let's do it. <laughs> and obviously everybody else was really into it too. Cause she's a, uh, she's a tall drink of water. She's uh, she's gorgeous. And uh, she is very competitive when it comes to those things. So um, she took to it very, very quickly. And so we've been, we, we did it for, for four or five years, we were doing it hard. You know, we we're at all the races, we we're traveling the country, going to the big barber vintage festival. And then um, we've sort of died down because my motorcycle experience with the racing out at Willow Springs, you know, um, I was there one afternoon at another track day. 
because we would have to go to these track days because we're taking a bar, a bike, a motorcycle to Birmingham, you know, and I'm spending thousands and thousands of dollars. I, 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 my motorcycle has to work. And the only place I can figure it out is at the track. So we did this thing. I, I remember taking it to Fontana, which is, you know, big banks and everything. And it's an SR 500 and everyone's looking at me weird. And even the event organizers were giving me crap. And I'm like, here's the deal. This is a race bike. See those, those aren't race bikes. There's no numbers on those. They've got headlights on them. I said, I can be, I I'm here to test and tune my motorcycle. You got all my money. You, it's $270 for your stupid track day, just so I can figure this out. And it was a wild scene, but I got through it. And after I left, I was like, screw you guys. I'm never coming back to this. Well, then I went to another track day at Willow Springs where we were there. Caroline's bike didn't even start. She didn't even take it through tech. I went over to the organizer and I said, listen, I'm gonna do the track day, but she didn't even go through tech. I mean, can she get a refund or something? He's like, Bruh. he hemmed and hawed and said, I'll give you 50% off this next track day on this date only. And I'm like, don't worry about it. Keep your money. We're packing up. I'm out of here. I don't want to be here. And I said, I, I went to the track owners, the youth family. And I said, listen, essentially at that point, I said, I'm making my own track day because I'm sick and tired of all these, you know, no refunds, you know, bad attitude, bad vibes, ego, all this stuff. And I said, let me go to the track and see if we can make something happen. And I was hanging out with all these racers, Scott Fabro, Brian Hertzfeld, Pat Wilkening, all my buddies from the Arma stuff. And they're all here in Southern California. I said, could we do this? And they're like, I think we can. And again, we just threw it at the wall. We got a super great deal on a hot August day at Willow Springs. So it's the hundreds of degrees. We're all melting. And we pulled off a track day. No one got hurt. Everything was fine. And, uh, so, you know, me and Caroline getting that together sort of developed into that track day thing where um, nowadays, going back to my statement about us not racing as much as we used to, but now we have access to the track all the time. And when we're not having a track day, the track's like, come on out, it's no big deal, whatever you want to do. So we've been focusing more on doing those track days and, and we sort of lost a lot of that competitive spirit, but we just started a new race series, which is an actual green flag and checkered flag um calling it the willow springs grand prix it um it happens in april last this this year in april of um and one of the images behind us is from the willow springs grand prix there with dick mann on it but um it turned it after our set is our second year and it went off the chains it was huge and we're very excited to say that it's going to continue so next year we will have another road race april 13th and 14th out at willow springs raceway focusing on vintage um, but accepting modern and the oddball sidecars, the whole nine yards. Um, so let me, and we've let, me also... let me interrupt a minute. So your vintage, can you categorize that and tell me uh, what the classifications are for people who well, may be interested in coming out there? Well, any bike is welcome. Um, but the way we talk about it, you know, just off the bat where you don't have to give us a phone call is anything pre 92 anything that's not that's carbureted anything that's air cooled is fine um so right off the bat air cooled you know there's a lot of bikes that fit what we're trying to get away is from the same old inline four super bike water cooled bikes that that are at every single track day uh so we've got you know people with baggers we've got cop bikes we've got a guy with a victory that leaves the bags on and he's got things so they don't scrape and he's running out there hundreds of miles an hour we get all the vintage stuff little mini italian bikes we get triumphs we get nortons we get real race stuff we get the sidecar guys coming out we get people on dual sports with dual sport tires running out on big willow because they're like this is my daily i want to learn how it runs and, and ride it we get a lot of support from people like Kevin Stanley at Moto Chop Shop. When I first started this, he was sending me a dozen Triumph, modern Triumphs every track day. And uh, and so that's what we focus on. Now, that being said, there's a lot of people that like our vibe because our vibe is really mellow, laid back, you know, and um, I, people that have modern super bikes, I say, call me. You have to, I have to vet you to find out if you're really into this or if I know if you're a douchebag right off the bat. Because I say, leave the ego at home. We're running, you know, you're going to get a chance to run fast, but this is, we're not feeding Moto America here. And so there's a lot of guys that are like, I was at this track day. I only got a few laps because there was red flags from people crashing or ambulances on the track. We've had the ambulance run once. 
The last two track days we've had, we haven't even had a red flag because I yell at everyone at the beginning of the day. Hey, this is how it's going to go. No BS. If you got any questions, come talk to me. But so a lot of these guys with these modern super bikes will come join our track day because they're like, hey, we can still go fast, but we don't have people being jerks around us or being dangerous. And we're and the track day actually runs and everyone's real happy. So um, that's the difference. So we allow anyone to come to classic track day. If you've got a modern super, like I get these phone calls, one guy, oh no, you said on the website, da, 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 da. I said, yeah. I said, well, what kind of bike you got? He's like, well, it's a 2023 J Jixer 1000. And I'm like, oh, that's a pretty fast bike. He's like, but I'm 82. And I just want to come out and spin some laps with my friends. And I'm like, no, you're in, you're totally in. Uh, and uh, so I have these great conversations with people about that. And it just means a lot to me because it's a small group. I mean, you get these huge events like Born Free or Babes Ride Out or, um, any of these massive events where there's thousands of people, the Sierra Stakeout, I love these things. Because trust me, I used to run the Venice Vintage. I knew what it was about to have 10,000 people there and, and and throwing a party. But this is a small group. If we have 100 people, that's massive. So yeah. normally we have between 50 and 60 riders at each track day with another 15 that are my staff and support. And once we get through the first couple of hours, it's just runs itself and we just have a ball. Hey, Brady, so tell me this. What's your oldest rider that's been on track day with you and what's your oldest vintage motorcycle? Oh, that's ridden with us. Um, I don't, you know, these old riders, I have to tell you probably Jim Granger, we would get him on the motorcycle too. his Russ, Russ's dad. And he's got to be in his eighties. I know that at multiple events, we've had dudes over their eighties. I don't really sit uh, down and go to, including my buddy, Phil, Phil Coleman, who just passed away. He came out and would ride a CBX. And it was mint. It was his pride and joy. And he was pretty darn old too. If not close to 80, he was in his seventies and he would come out there on those hot August days. And we're all young, young, you know, 40, we're young and uh, just sweating like dogs. And he would just have the biggest smile on his face. Um, really yeah. good stuff. The oldest bike that we've ever had on the track is um, this one kid. I forget his name, but he's brought it to a couple of my um, my bike shows as well. But he brought out like a 1952 Norton single and it was a pile of crap. So the first time he brought it out, he's like, I'm going to ride this. And I'm like, no, you're not. <laughs> I said, this thing's a mess. They couldn't even get it started. The tires were flat. I was like, this is a mess. I said, you've got to fix it and bring it back. So the next time he brought it back and everyone you know, because I've been the people that come to my track day, especially the support people are people that have been doing this for years and years and years. And this is why they're there. It's not work. This is fun. It's 120 degrees. Some guy's got a stupid old Norton that's ble bleeding oil everywhere. Let's get down and help him, you know, and get it going. So he got that on the track and that's just really, really fun. But, right you know, when you start to get those two strokes out there, we have a lot of RS 125s and other oddball two strokes that just make a lot of noise. And yeah. you get into fancy, fancy old motorcycles that are, you know, not baffled, that are full on race bikes. You just sort of go, this is cool. This is really cool. So it's not just about the bikes and it's not about going fast. It's about the whole thing together with the camaraderie, a place for us to be able to do this stuff. And, um, and at the end of the day, it's, 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 it's a really, it's a really cool thing. So anyone who wants to come out, they can come out and spectate and even ride the track at noon for like 20 bucks. We do four laps. But anyone can come out and it's just even for just for spectating, it's a pretty neat time. Right. And these are Willow Springs and you're doing those about four times a year? Yes, we do a couple of track days at the Big Willow track, which is the famous one. And then we do a couple at the smaller one called the Streets to Willow, which is uh, favorable to small bikes, but it's also a little more technical and a little more fun. And um, one of the track days we have bookended uh, on the same weekend with that Willow Springs Grand Prix. So that's a lot of fun. And then you also have, what's the uh, Willow Springs Roundup? Well, because we also got into flat track racing, because that's been popular in the last 10 years, and we would go down and do Ivy League flat track, and we'd go over to Ventura. You know, essentially none of us knew what we were doing, but we were hanging out with the Deus crew and like, okay, I'll buy a flat track, <laughs> a little SR500 flat tracker. And go out and do this. And there used to be a guy, he's still around, um, Eddie Mulder. He's a super famous road racer, TT racer, 
um, from back in the day. And he ran his races at Willow Springs flat track um, for, for decades and decades. It was huge. I mean, everyone was there, $75,000 purses, you know, all the equipment, everything else. Well, he stopped doing it and people would come to me and be like, can we do, can we go out to the flat track? Because now it's just tumbleweeds and just, it, there's nothing out there. It's, it's just crazy, but it just overgrown. And I'm like, I don't know. Let me, let me talk to the track owner. And I'm like, Hey, we're thinking about maybe going and doing He's Like, sure. If you want to, he's like, we'll give you a little bit of water and just go out. And so we started doing track days. I do a couple of them out there doing the flat track. So people could come out. I would charge them like 30 bucks and we get a couple of dozen people. And I would just say, Hey, just don't hurt each other. Just go out and rip and do whatever the heck you want. Well, then it started to get the word got around and more people that knew that track from the history. They're like, we need to be at Willow. It's a three eighths mile clay banked or no DG and clay banked oval. And it's very fast and it's different because a lot of these short tracks down here in Southern California. So with a lot of pressing and then a couple of the people coming to me being like, we need to do this. We need to do a race. And I'm like, I can, I can put it together. I don't know the first thing about running a flat track race. I know how to do it. I'm like, okay, you're working for beer and hot dogs. (laughs) <laughs> let's do it you know here and we got a volunteer staff and yeah. so we threw a few races to great success and the last one we, we put it down i said this is the, the name of it it's called the willow springs roundup i like it because willow springs raceway itself is like the wild west there's not many facilities it's privately owned there's a bunch of tracks but it's in the high desert and you don't know what you're going to get depending on the day it could be sleeting and snow or it could be 120 degrees with 100 mile an hour winds constant and um So my nod to the Willow Springs Roundup was it's the Wild West out there. We got a little bit of a cowboy theme. We only are going to do it once a year because it's so special. It's a lot of logistics to get it done because it's dilapidated. But we're going to do that. I believe it's September 29th and 30th of this year. Practice on Friday, race on Saturday. I've made some new friends that are going to come help me run it. And so anyone who's interested in getting out to the very famous Willow Springs, they call it the Walt James Stadium, um, but we're going to do the Willow Springs Roundup out there in se- late September, so it should be a lot of fun. So, I guess you know, you just w- for me, as as I go through life and I have these different experiences, I just sort of say, well, that was fun, but you know, I did it once; it's great. Like yeah. the Biltwell 100, Biltwell 100, they go out to Ridgecrest and they're driving hundreds of miles in the desert and all this. I said, you know what? I did it once; that was great. I have no desire to run something like this or do it again. I'm going to come out and party and have a good time. But when I started to do the flat track thing, it it was very much like the road race guys. It's a family. It's, it's more than the sport itself. It's the family. It's the camaraderie. It's the, I mean, they take care of each other. And so I was immediately attracted to it. And a lot of the guys that come out again are old, old and crusty and just having a good old time. And just it's grinning and they're like, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And when you get that kind of feedback, you're like, sometimes I feel kind of responsible or maybe obligated. And so we haven't done this flat track thing for a few years. And so when this kid called me up, following up on another email about the other race, the road race, he's like, I got 10 emails that day from, a, from me announcing the road race stuff. And they're like, when are we going to flat track? So we'll do that again out there at Willow Springs. I hope people can make it out. And again, it's just, it's just a lot of fun. And at the end of the day, you might make enough money for some pizza and beer. Um, but as long as he puts a smile on your face and no one gets hurt, you know, I'm going to continue doing it. You know, that's what motorcycling started with, you know, all the old hill climbs way back in the day in the thirties, forties, you know, fifties and stuff. People came for the party. Yeah. The competition was cool. Come home with a trophy. Maybe, maybe not, but the camaraderie, hanging with your friends, having a good time, you know what I mean? No stress. You know what I mean? Just a, a great well, thing. For the spectators, on, yeah. it's no stress. I'm always stressed. And especially at those big races, I tell you, um, Rusty, I just finally got an LLC a couple of years ago, Classic Enterprises, because people were scratching their head like, you're running track days and you don't have an LLC. I'm like, what's that all about? What does that mean? So once we got to the point where we're actually you know, racing, road racing at the fastest track in the West, there is a good chance that someone could die. I mean, that's a given much more so than the flat track stuff or, you know, low speed kind of things. So I'm on edge all, you know, especially for those races, because I've got my ambulance, I've got my liability insurance, you know, to the hilt. Uh, I've got a great team and a great staff, but until, 
you know, we're down to that last race and the checkered flag goes, that's finally when I can kick back and be like, oh my gosh, look at what we did. This is amazing. So the one of the balances, and you probably, because I know you do events and things, you've got to sort of balance your, when you're doing these events, you can't just be a crazy maniac, all this like, leave me alone, I'm busy, I'm doing this right now. You just got to sort of <laughs> suck it in and just put it in a ball way down and be like, the whole place is on fire. You're like, yeah, everything's great. This is, are you having a good time? Me too. <laughs> you might have a great time. I'm going to go back here in this room and scream for about 30 <laughs> seconds and then I'll be okay. <laughs> right on, man. All right. So now on top of all this, you also set up home studios, do voiceover work and, and a bunch of stuff as well, right? Well, um, that was my initial, you know, my, my, the degree I got in college at university of Michigan was, uh, audio technology and, um, engineering and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, I wanted to be a rock star and I didn't have what it took to be a rock star, mostly living in a, you know, in a, uh, in a uh, storage unit and, you know, showering <laughs> once a month or something and just playing rock and roll. I couldn't do that. I had too much support. I was too smart. So I got an engineering degree degree um, from the University of Michigan and I started off at Ron Rose Productions in Detroit which is a big commercial facility working for Lincoln Mercury and Ford and you know your local Kroger markets and doing all that and then I moved out to Los Angeles specifically to do that I worked in some rock and roll places because again I wanted to be rock and roll so the first place I got a job at was the um it's called Paramount Recording, nothing to do with Paramount Studios, but it was over on Hollywood and Vine. And they, back in the day, Led Zeppelin and Jimi Hendrix was there. It's a three-room facility. And at the time that I was there, it was like Zach Wilde's uh, band did a lot of stuff there. Um, a couple of big rap groups were in there. And I worked there for about a month for $5, under the $5 an hour under the table at the night shift, being like, what in the heck is happening here? This is crazy. Uh, the biggest rule of working there at this place was, Here's the deal. At the end of the night, you come down. If there's people working in the studio because they're tracking on 24 track uh, tape and you know, the engineer will bring you the tape and then you have to collect the payment before you give them the tape. And I said, okay, you're tr trusting me with this. Okay. The only thing you need to remember is if someone pulls a gun on you, just give them the tape. And I'm like, what? And I'm green. I'm just here from Michigan. I was like hanging out with my aunt in Garden Grove. The money I made didn't cover the gas. That's and hilarious. I was like, what is happening? But I sent out 150 resumes on a fax machine from Ron Rose. When I quit the job, I was like, I'll be here for three months. I'll give you three weeks notice. And I'm just sitting there used at night, just burning up their fax machine and sending out resumes. And I got a job working at a commercial facility in Santa Monica which was great. And I bounced around for a couple of commercial facilities before I worked, uh, I got a job at Fox broadcasting. So I worked over at the Fox, uh, the Pico lot over there, the big, you know, Fox studios making a ton of money. I'm a union guy. And all of a sudden I was like, Oh my gosh, I just saw my commercial on the Super Bowl. This is kind of neat, you know? And you know, it was great corporate couldn't stand it, but it, it gave me the income I could to keep doing all these little festivals and all these other little endeavors, you know, for all those years. Um, and so when I was still before the Fox thing, I was working at one of these little studios, one of the clients came back or the talent and said, Hey, I just got a job with this Martha Stewart show and I need to have a home studio because they have the booth and the ISDN, which talked to the people in New York. And so he had to have the whole thing set up. And my, he said, go talk to Brady. So Sandy Simpson came back there and I set him up with this beautiful booth and he's like, this is great. And I was charging like $10 an hour, which I should have been charging like $400 an hour. Anyway, I just got getting more phone calls, word of mouth. And then I started meeting talent agencies because they heard of me word of mouth. And I met a couple big ones like William Morris and Vox Inc and TGMD and artists United. And all of a sudden they're like, you're our guy. You're awesome. Everyone loves you. And so I stopped, I didn't even have to do any marketing. It was all just people calling me all the time. Then the pandemic hit. And then all of a sudden you had to have a home studio, even though for a decade people had home studios, especially the big guys. So uh, we were kicking back up here at the ranch, um, you know, the, the first few, few weeks of the pandemic. And I'm like, this is great. You know, we're getting unemployment. We're getting the feds sending us money and we're just doing nothing. And then all of a sudden I had a, one of my client, my talent call me. He's like, Brady, you got to get down to LA now everyone's freaking out. They need your help right now. So I just, I put like 20 grand on my credit card, 
to Sweetwater and had him just shipping stuff. And so through the whole pandemic, I was rocking and rolling at the little ho house in Pasadena, having fun doing that. And I continue to do it. So if there's one thing that's sort of been a, um, a consistent sort of pattern in my lifestyle, my life is that I haven't just sort of focused on one thing. I found different little passions and I sort of wrote them out when the, when the time came or whatever. And now that I'm, you know, getting into my late forties, I can kick back and have the things come to me. I have a dozen events on the calendar a year that are set in stone with the track days and all that. But then I'll get people calling me for the home studio randomly like, Hey, yeah, sure. I'll, whatever. I'll come down and do it. No problem. Um, hey, uh, I'm starting the show, but I need someone to take care of this with all these bikes and people. Can you do that? Sure. Okay, great. Um, I, we went to Chicago this year for Motoblot. My friend Larry um, had me running his sh uh, the bike show there um, over the weekend. Um, I met some Keith Kaiser, the executive director of the AMCA, because I was working at the IMS shows. I was running the vintage bike so show stuff for the international motorcycle shows for a few years. And he's like, Brady, you, if I ever go, I've got the lady who's in charge to call you <laughs> specifically because you're going to take over the AMCA and be the executive director. You're the guy in line. I'm like, no, but they've had a few shows and I've gone out to New York and done that with them. And so I just feel really blessed now that we have, you know, there's, it, it just takes a lot of stress off of it that we don't have to sit and grind anymore, you know? So we're, we're very blessed to be up here and, and doing all this fun stuff and having a little bit of diversity and creativity. Man, you're living the life. You know what I mean? It's like when you, when you do what you love, you never work yeah. another day in your life. That's exactly yeah. right. That's exactly right. And the other thing that I've seen a lot is, is that if you're, if you approach something from the passion side, you know, versus like, oh, I got to sit down and create this hustle, you know, to try and make some coin, you know, I'm like, my, what, how many times did I come home with Caroline? How much money did you make at the last track day? I'm like, uh, I lost like $2,000. Hmm. Next one. How much did you lose at that one? Hmm. But then <laughs> you get a couple of good ones. You're like, look at this. I got a pile of money for this one. Yay! So you sort of gotta you gotta ride that wave but also you know approach these things from a passionate side because i am a firm believer that the universe will give you what you what you're That's looking right. for or what you need not what you want but what you need my guru uh, my meditation guru always used to said the universe is going to take you where it's going to take you whether you go willingly or if you go kicking and screaming it's taking you there That's right. so i said you know what? I'm not going to strive for this big Hollywood lifestyle. I'm not going to buy any fancy cars or make any more mortgages. I'm just going to kick back and I'm just going to have some fun with this. And um, that's where we're at now. And um, I do have to say that, you know, doing these things, you catch the eyes of people who are into it. And rather than trying to go after people that are maybe not into it or something like that, they come to you. That's and right. one thing I wanted to say to you, Rusty, is... Um, I met Sean Mahoney, my friend, um, who was a very young man. We were both very young, <laughs> probably in our 20s back then, doing the Venice Vintage Show because he was in Venice. And it was right when he first started doing Russ Brown. And after a year or so, he's like, hey, we love what you're doing. We want to help support. And I think I've been working with Russ Brown now for, gosh, 15 years, maybe. I don't know. In some, some aspect, at least that long. And... What Russ Brown does is just like my track days or these races, it's a family thing, you know, yeah. and they bring this, this family approach to their marketing, their support, all that kind of stuff. And one thing I'm, you know, going back to not stressing out, I can guarantee, almost guarantee every spring or J January, when I get on the phone with Sean and we talk about this, that, that there's going to be some support there. Um, and that, that means a lot because it allows me to be able to maybe, dive into a new venture or do something that you're not going to make money on be like for instance the californian um that is a show after i left the venice vintage club i started doing it santa anita park santa anita park and you know the horse racing track came to me they're like hey we want you to do this i'm like okay <laughs> they came to me so we did a uh it's, it's a beautiful show we do it on kentucky derby day so we got the horse racing the girls in hats and sundresses you know the dapper guys with you know they love that stuff and we do a big static show with the big beauty in the background. This year, I knew I was going to lose money. I knew it. 
And the only reason I was able to move forward with it was because of the support from Russ Brown, because I said, you know what, Russ is, Russ Brown has given me just enough coin to be able to, you know, get close. Obviously I got a few more sponsors with friends at Moto Chop Shop, um, and a few other handfuls of people like, um, all my classic people like classic British spares or JRC engineering. But because of that initial support, it makes someone like me or maybe a builder or maybe a racing person to be able to say, Hey, yeah, we can make the trip to Chicago this year because we've got gas money. Thank God for Russ Brown. So please yeah. pass that on to the, to the big wigs, you know, and I, I, I do my best to always, uh, to always thank you guys when, whenever I'm talking about any of my events, because you know, you know, we can't do it. A lot of us can't do it without you. And so we appreciate it very much. I know a lot of people would say the same thing. Well, yeah, no doubt about it. You know, just uh, for an example, also, uh, you've got a bait and all the MRFs, you know, writers foundations that are uh, at the front lines fighting against uh, unfair legislation and, and, you know, things where they do a little bit overreach and Russ Brown's behind all that and supporting these people hard. And, and people don't really hear about that that much. These guys, people hear about a bait. They really don't know what they're up to, you know, but they're, they're tell me, tell me a little bit day. about, a, tell me a little bit about a bait because <laughs> believe it or not, I have a, a voice message on my phone that I have, haven't responded to yet. It's been, it's been a busy week. We were on the road for six weeks, um, traveling the, traveling the Northeast. And then we just got back. We just had friends before the July, but it was a, it was a guy from a bait who said, Hey, I want to come up and set up your classic track day. And I was like, what, what is a bait? A bait is basically on the front line. They they work daily. They have lobbyists that they have up in Sacramento. They're they're across the whole nation, but they they're broke up into states. In California, there's lobbyists, the Lombardo Group, with James and Jim Lombardo. They've been there for decades, working with legislators, and they work hand in hand with all these people to try to stem you know, legislation that's, that's a little bit oppressive, you know what I mean? And, and protect bikers rights. And mm -hmm, we're mm -hmm. all benefiting from it across the nation, millions of riders from the work that a few do. And it's really nice because Russ Brown's offices, they support everything they're doing and help them to accomplish what's happening. Cause that's they're awesome. all working for free. Yeah. You know, everybody in all those, those motorcycle rights foundations, they're all just donating their time and it's, it's like a job. It actually takes more than their job a lot of the time to accomplish. So uh, my hat's off to those people and uh, also to uh, Russ Brown for all the support that's been happening for years and will continue to happen. Good. I appreciate it. And I'm going to get on the phone with him after our conversation and call him back and say, hey, get out here because uh, that's Great. exactly what we need. We need those guys uh, that 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 actually know how to do that stuff because a lot of us are just bonehead bikers that just love having our hair in the wind you know just like thank you so that's cool yeah thanks for explaining that because that that is huge um i saw we're again we're in the northeast and man being on some of these hot roads and motorcycles can't even split lanes and i'm like i don't know i would just be like i i bye I'm like, catch me if you can. I mean, like, and it's 110 degrees with humidity and they're like full, full out on these big Harleys. And I'm just like, oh, I feel miserable. Well, that that's a good example right there. You can thank the Motorcycle Riders Foundations for all that yeah. right there for stopping that and helping keep it. Because I'm telling you, especially I live here right by the 405 freeway at L.A. Oh, yeah. That's, that's like ridiculous. If you had to fall in line with the cars and couldn't split lanes. Well, With an air cooled motor, you know, yeah. you're going to fry your motor and you're, oh my you know, gosh. It's crazy. Or you get smushed because, you know, if a big semi, you're, you're down here, Cruncho, you know, I, <laughs> I, yeah. I, I, a lot of my friends would, uh, you know, we're in Los Angeles. A lot of people work five days a week and uh, they live for the weekends. Let's go up to the crest, you know, let's go out to Malibu. I'm like, I ride motorcycles for a lifestyle. Like, I lived in Pasadena and worked on the West side. I mean, that would have been half my life in the car if I didn't have a motorcycle yeah. and I just get on and go for it. I come into work, you know, sometimes they're like, what's wrong? I'm like, Oh, I, I've just been splitting lanes at 90 miles an hour for the last 30 miles. And you know, it was crazy and I almost got killed by a hundred people. Um, so yeah, that's really important um, to have them there and fighting for all that stuff. And again, 
when people would call and they say, let's go out for a ride. I'm like, I've already got like 300 miles into this week. They're like, huh? I'm like, I know I ride. I'm going to work. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> You're driving in a car. Anyway, anyway, it's all fun. I love motorcycles. I, I, I love it to death. And it represents freedom. It represents, you know, just silliness and, and just, you can get out there, especially where we're at. We'll go out for a ride once a day, just around the basin. And yeah, it just takes, it just puts you in your, in your, in your immediate consciousness. You've got to focus on a couple quick things as you start to get used to it. But then all of a sudden it all just floats into the background and you're just feeling the bike and riding around and being in nature. And, uh, I recommend it to anybody. I'm with you. I'm with you. All right. Well, look, uh, this has been a great interview. Do you have anything else you want to add before we close out? The only thing I could say, Rusty, is if anyone wants to know more about what we're doing here, um, they can go to my website. It's uh, pretty simple, uh, bradywalker.com. And there's a landing page to all the different events that I do and things like that. Um, so please check it out. If you're into learning more about your motorcycle um, and learning more about your riding, come out to classic track day. This is not a scary thing. I have two people coming to my next event because they're bringing three or four people with them because they're nervous about the whole thing. And they're going to hold their hand and let them ride their motorcycle and the whole nine yards, because people have a perception about this. Like it's crazy where it's really not what a lot of people, like I said, come and they learn about themselves, learn their riding style. But on any, on any day, it's like a little mini museum and these bikes are out there on the track. So for spectators, it's great. Um, the next event I've got coming up is with Arma, working with the American Historic Motorcycle Racing Association, and we're going to be at Laguna Seca next weekend. So um, uh, actually the weekend after next, and that's going to be fun. I'm going to do the bike show for them there. So come check that out. And then uh, hopefully we see some people come out to Willow Springs this fall for a track day or maybe for the races out at the flat track. And, uh, you know, that's that's I guess all I can say right now. I appreciate everybody. I appreciate Russ Brown. And I appreciate the people that um, that dig what I'm doing. And um, and as long as I still have those people supporting me and helping me and those big grins, I'm going to continue doing it. I really appreciate everything you're doing. And, and I'm a fan now, so I'm going to be out there. I got to check it out. Listen, you can come anytime you want. Be my guest. You guys do so yeah. much for me. We work with Alpine Stars, my friend Heath Coffrin, and we can get you all the gear. We can get you a suit and we can get you boots and gloves. All you need is a full face helmet. So we we make it very simple. We give people no excuses. All you got to do is get there and pay for the darn thing. Um, but you could be my guest anytime you want. August 5th. And then we're doing the streets, I believe, in mid-November, like November 13th or 12th or something like that. So anytime you get a wild hair and you and your buddies want to come out to the track, yeah. If you don't want to be super hot, wait till November. <laughs> if you don't mind super yeah. hot, come out in August. You lose some weight, and uh, it's a hell of a fun time. So I hope to see you out there, Rusty. Right on, man. Thanks for being here.